1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Kind of a good tie in there to James chapter 4 that we just read. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. How do you cast your cares upon the Lord? Um, just mental thing. You pray. You're supposed to have a good relationship with your Father. When does the relationship start? When you get saved, humble yourself. Turn from your self-righteous pride of thinking that you can save yourself, of thinking that you're not a bad person. You see? But how do you, how do you uh, come to the Lord for prayer if all you've ever done is just taken salvation to yourself without asking for it? I mean, use my son as an analogy. He goes and he sees a cookie that he wants instead of saying dad dad can I have a cookie just go take it and he's going to have a good relationship with me come over and talks to me and I say what happened to that cookie out there on the shelf I took it why didn't you ask me I don't need to I just take what I want <laughs> okay a little pride there Verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, and for that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. I uh, remember there was a woodturner, Bert Marsh, over in the UK, I don't know if he's even alive anymore. But back when I was a wood, you know, wood turning artist, uh, he was one of the guys I really looked up to. I uh, never met him or anything in person, but and he said, words of wisdom. He said, uh, always strive to make the perfect wooden bowl or vessel, whatever you're making. Always strive for perfection because you're always going to do your best. Okay, don't get upset because you're never going to reach perfection, you know, as an artist, but. Always strive for your best. Always strive for that perfect peace. Never say, well, that's good enough or whatever else. And I've kind of adopted that as a wood turner. I adopted it way back when, and I've kind of kept it in as a Christian. I always try to do my best. Sometimes I fall short. Sometimes you're going to fall short. But notice it says there, The God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, He'll not allow you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. After you've suffered a while, what's he going to do? Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Do you need to be settled right now? Would it be nice to have some peace in this insane world? Mm -hmm. Well, after you've suffered a little while, you're going to get that. If you're doing right. Again, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, and this is so important here, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What you're going through, I'm going through. What I'm going through, you're going through. Maybe not exactly the same thing, the same people, the same names, whatever else, but that's one of the reasons I leave the comments open. On my videos because number one it helps you to get kicked around a little bit you're going to see what it's like to to suffer as a christian uh some of these wicked people that come onto this channel and i see you trying to witness to them and stuff and you, you know you get kicked and slammed and whatever else well some of that's good for you don't get too much into fighting them you know remember the thing uh a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject okay don't keep fighting with these people give them two admonitions and then you reject them as a heretic but it's also I also leave the comments open so that brothers and sisters in Christ can, can comment back and forth and encourage one another. That's also very important. And you're going to see the struggles that you are having, the things that you are thinking about, the things that are on your mind. You're going to see other brothers and sisters in Christ going through those same things. And, you know, I wish I could make some kind of a, 
a place that's safe and, and people can comment back and forth and not have these lost infiltrators coming in all the time and messing up and whatever else, you know. I mean, i got to say this real quick, too. I actually saw in the news not long ago that Monsanto, the big uh, GMO giant that's messing up the, all the crops and everything else, going to answer big time for that, but they're actually hiring people to troll comments. I forget what the thing's called. Uh, there's some kind of a name for it, but crazy times in which we live. But again, I mean, I, there's so much that could be said about this passage here, but I'm going to continue. Two more places to turn to, and then we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter four, verses ten through fourteen. Okay. Here's where the solutions come in. All right. Here's one of the best ways to resist the devil. You know, we read back there in First Peter five, resist the devil. Here's what you do to resist him. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Having, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we suffer it. Being defamed we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you. And I will warn you about that. The more work you do for the Lord, the more... Not only are you going to be approving yourself as the ministers of Christ, you're going to see yourself in that list. You're also going to get some of this. But here's the power. Here's the, here's the good thing to do. See if I can find it. One of my mentors and a guy that uh, I had some strong disagreements with Dr. Ruckman, but uh, I've also learned a lot and I've, I respect him for a lot of reasons. And this book right here is just kind of a classic work of his. You know, the power of negative thinking. You know, and uh, there is power in negative thinking. When you start to realize the negative things that are going to happen to you as a Christian, and you say, instead of looking at it and going, oh, this is really terrible and stuff, and this is bad, start to enjoy it, you know. I mean, you know, and you gotta, again, you got to be careful. You don't want to get, you know, overly sarcastic to the point where you're just being a jerk and whatever else. And, you know, Ruckman, you know, he sometimes was right on that line, <laughs> you know. Uh, he'll let you draw your own conclusions there. But the fact is, you have to make a fool for, out of yourself sometimes and enjoy it. So what are you talking about? Um, you know, go out and do some tracting. If you have an opportunity to speak up for Jesus Christ and make a fool of yourself, do it. Um I had a hard time, I might do a video on this eventually, uh, motorsports type of stuff, you know, I was very, very prideful with my vehicles and, and fast cars and, you know, fast motorcycles and the whole deal, and, and I'd get involved in road rage stuff and whatever else as a lost man, and I was quite hot-headed, and, uh, you know, I, I might not seem that way, but I was into, like, the extreme sports stuff and whatever else. Might eventually do a video about that in particular if people are interested in that. I don't know. But the point is, um, I was very prideful with, with my vehicles. And that's why today uh, I try to put uh, bumper stickers and things, witnessing things, to make myself look pretty foolish. And have people, you know, laughing at me and whatever else. It uh, puts my flesh down. And it keeps me in mind if some guy's driving too slow in front of me or whatever else, um, just deal with it. Use the time, the extra time to pray to the Lord or something. <laughs> you know, Don't let the anger start rising up and don't, you know, I'm going to pass this guy or some guy comes flying up behind me and he's, you know, like, don't get prideful. Just use it as a chance to witness. You know, <laughs> look like a fool for Jesus Christ once in a while is what I'm saying. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 46 through 49. I'm going to show you a good example of 
um, looking like a fool for Jesus Christ and what happens as a result. Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, look at this, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Hmm. Again, you might find yourself in a situation someday where you're going to feel the Lord's prompting to speak up. I'm going to read an example of it here in just a couple minutes. Be open for those opportunities. And you never know what the Lord's going to do through it. The Lord's given me a few of those times. And it's embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. It's hard for the flesh. Uh, when you do that and you wax bold and you speak up and you say, you know what, what you're doing is wrong or this is wrong or whatever else. And the people look at you like you're nuts. But that's the way you resist the devil. That's the way you fight the devil. And the Word of God gets published as a result. And I'll tell you another little, another little thing. You say, well, Brother Brian, I'm not quite ready. I'm just newly saved. Okay, here's another thing that you can do. I don't have any right here nearby. Um, but gospel tracts. Um, one of the best things that you can do, and I can speak from years of experience in this, okay? When you mess up bad, all right? I mean, when you have something that you do and you just think to yourself, I can't believe I just did that. That's another thing it's, you're going to have a hard time with as a Christian. Um, you're going to get to points in time where you, you do some kind of sin, you mess up so bad and you think to yourself, how could I do that if, that if I was really saved? Okay, you get to that point, you say, okay, well, what do I need to do to be saved if I'm not really saved? And you say, well, I already did that. Well, then you're saved, okay? <laughs> you know, um, if you've called out you know, to the Lord and the Lord saved you and you've seen that changed life that comes as a result of real salvation, okay, you're saved. Uh, the sin that you messed up on, what can you do about that? Well, the best thing that you can do is make a fool of yourself for Jesus Christ. But if you say, well, I'm just kind of new, okay, you mess up, here's what you do. You go out and you say, okay, Lord, tell me where you want me to tract. And you get a big stack of gospel tracts. You can print up your own. You can write your own. You can you can buy some, you know, whatever. You get a big thing of gospel tracts, and you say, all right, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to put these gospel tracts someplace. Start out small. You don't have to go up and hand them to people and whatever else and get in conversations. Start out. Work your way up. Go out there and say, okay, because I did such and such sin, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to fight the devil. The devil tempted me into doing that thing and my flesh and they messed me up and stuff. So because of that, I'm going to make him pay. And I'm going to go out, I'm going to put out, you know what, that last time I did that thing, um, I put out 25 tracks that last time at the stores or whatever in my town or area. I'm going to put out 50 this time. And then next time you work your way up, you say, I'm going to put out 50 tracks, only this time I'm going to hand out half of them to people. I'm just going to walk up and say, would you like a track? Or we just, here you go, this is for you. Whatever. See? That's how you resist the devil. But I'm going to read you a story about boldness for Jesus Christ and what can happen as a result. This is the book right here about Peter Cartwright. And these old-time Christians had a, had a power to them. They were something else, I'll tell you what. So this is written probably about 18, 1820 or so, I think. Yeah, 1820 to 1824. Okay, um, Talks about relating an incident or two that occurred in 1820 to 1824. Okay, I think you'll enjoy this story. It says here, Shortly after this, Brother Walker left me to visit some of his friends and relatives in West Tennessee. And I journeyed on toward my home in Christian County, Kentucky. Saturday night came on and found me in a strange region of country and in the, the hills, knobs, and spurs of the Cumberland Mountains. I greatly desired to stop on the approaching Sabbath and spend it with a Christian people. 
but I was now in a region or of country where there was no gospel minister for many miles around, and where, as I learned, many of the scattered population had never heard a gospel sermon in all their lives, and where the inhabitants knew no Sabbath, only to hunt and visit, drink and dance. Now, when he says Sabbath, he's meaning Sunday. Okay, that's old timers would they'd say the Sabbath, meaning Sunday. Uh, of course, the Bible in the New Testament doesn't specify you have to worship on a Sunday. It's, you know, I think you should worship seven days a week. But Anyhow, continuing, he says, Thus lonesome and pensive, late in the evening, I hailed at a tolerable, tolerably decent house, and the landlord kept entertainment. I rode up and asked for quarters, place to stay in other words. The gentleman said I could stay, but he was afraid I would not enjoy myself very much as a traveler, inasmuch as they had a party had a party meeting there that night to have a little dance. I inquired how far it was to a decent house of entertainment on the road. He said seven miles. I told him if he would treat me civilly and feed my horse well, by his leave I would stay. He assured me I should be treated civilly. I dismounted and went in. The people collected a large company. I saw there was not much drinking going on. By the way, Methodists, old-time Methodists, they hated dancing. <laughs> it was like very worldly. You know, I quietly took my seat in one corner of the house and the dance commenced. I sat quietly musing a total stranger and greatly desired to preach to this people. See, the Lord's starting to put that conviction there. Listen to what happens. This is incredible. Finally, I concluded to spend the next day, Sabbath, there and ask the privilege to preach to them. I had hardly settled this point in my mind when a beautiful, ruddy young lady walked very gracefully up to me dropped a handsome courtesy, and pleasantly, with winning smiles, invited me out to take a dance with her. I can hardly describe my thoughts or feelings on that occasion. However, in a moment, I resolved on a desperate experiment. I rose as gracefully as I could. I will not say with some emotion, but with many emotions. I was, he was scared. The young lady moved to my right side. I grasped her right hand with my right hand, while she leaned her left arm on mine. In this position, we walked on the floor. The whole company seemed pleased at this act of politeness in the young lady, shown to a stranger. The collared man who was the fiddler began to put his fiddle in the best order. I then spoke to the fiddler to hold a moment and added that for several years I had not undertaken any matter of importance without first asking the blessing of God upon it. And as I desired now to ask the blessing of God upon this beautiful young lady and the whole company. That had shown such an act of politeness to a total stranger. Here I grasped the young lady's hand tightly and said, Let us all kneel down and pray. And then instantly dropped on my knees and commenced praying with all the power of soul and body that I could command. He was yelling, in other words. The young lady tried to get loose from me, but I held her tight. Presently she fell on her knees. Some of the company kneeled, some stood, some fled, some sat still, all looked curious. <laughs> the fiddler ran off into the kitchen saying, Lord of mercy, what the matter? What does that mean? While I prayed, some wept and wept out loud, and some cried for mercy. I rose from my knees and commenced an exhortation, after which I sang a hymn. The young lady who invited me on the floor lay prostrate crying earnestly for mercy. I exhorted again. I sang and prayed nearly all night. About 15 of that company professed religion. Again, back then, when they say professed religion, that means they got saved. And our meeting lasted next day and next night, and as many more were powerfully converted. I organized a society, took 32 into the church, and sent them a preacher. My landlord was appointed leader, which post he held for many years. This was the commencement of a great and glorious revival of religion in that region of country, and several of the young men converted at this Methodist preacher dance became useful ministers of Jesus Christ. How about that? Here's where he gets into the thing, explains it. I recall this strange scene of my life with astonishment to this day, and do not permit myself to reason on it much. In some conditions of society I should have failed, in others... I should have been mobbed. In others, I should have been considered a lunatic. As far as I did permit myself to reason on it, at the time, my conclusions were something like these. There are a people not gospel taught or hardened. 
They at this early hour have not drank to intoxication, and they will at least be as much alarmed at me and my operations as I possibly can be at theirs. If I fail, it is no disgrace. If I succeed, it will be a fulfillment of a duty commanded. Hmm. To be instant in season and out of season. Surely in all human wisdom it was out of season, but I had from some cause or other a strong impression on my mind from the beginning to the end of this affair. It is ended that I should succeed by taking the devil at surprise as he had often served me and thereby be avenged of him for giving me so much trouble. On my way to general conference and back thus far, the actions prompted by these sudden impressions to perform religious duty often succeed beyond all human calculation and thereby inspire a confident belief in an immediate superintending agency of the divine Spirit of God. In this agency of the Holy Spirit of God, I have been a firm believer for more than 54 years, and I do firmly believe that, it is, that if the ministers of the present day had more of the unction or baptismal fire of the Holy Ghost prompting their ministerial efforts, we should succeed much better than we do and be more successful in winning souls to Christ than we are. If those ministers or young men that think they are called of God to minister in the word and doctrine of Jesus Christ were to cultivate by a holy life a better knowledge of the supreme agency of the divine spirit and depend less on the learned theological knowledge of biblical institutes, it is my opinion that they would do vastly more good than they are likely to do. And I would humbly ask, is not this the grand secret of the success of all early pioneer preachers from John Wesley down to the present day? In other words, brethren, if you didn't understand what he's saying there, he's saying to be a successful Christian, you have to know, first of all, when is the Holy Spirit opening up a door of utterance for me? When is he giving me that chance to stand out and make a fool of myself and do something for Jesus Christ? Secondly, God give me the courage to do it. I mean, he goes to this place, he's going to use this dance, it's a vexing thing and whatever else. And he says, okay, people are probably going to think I'm crazy for this, but uh, I'm going to make a fool of myself for Jesus Christ. What's the worst that can happen? I'll tell you what, it's a challenge. I had that thing highlighted years and years and years ago. It's been another one that's kind of inspired me and stuff. And people say, you know, Brother Brian, you take a lot of really hard stands and things. Yeah. Why? Because I know what happens if I don't. I'm obsessed with my subject, you see. I just want to exhort you out there, brethren. And this, this challenges me again. You know, just to look for those times when the Lord will say, say something. Wax bold here, you know. Say something there. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for, for your word. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I don't always preach it all that clearly, and sometimes I confuse people by not saying things correctly and whatever else. I'm not the greatest preacher out there, I realize, but uh, Lord, I just really get convicted about this stuff, and, and um, I just pray, Lord, that you give me more courage uh, to take those stronger stands, Lord, and not care at all what people think about me. And I pray the same thing out there for my brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would all look for those opportunities when you prompt us and uh, to realize that we have nothing to fear from the people on this earth. Nothing at all. You'll protect us, Lord. You'll be behind us. And I just really do pray, Lord, that you give us all chances and opportunities to witness for thee and um, to fight the devil to resist him so that he doesn't destroy us. And I pray, Lord, if there's some Christian right now that's that's very tempted to go the way of Demas and get away from the Bible-believing movement because the fighting is just so bad sometimes, I pray that you would give him strength and conviction to fight the devil, to get back into the battle. Take some time off once in a while, sure, but get back into the battle and realize that our time is very short that we have to serve you. And I uh, just thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me and for all that you do for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
So that's going to be it. I apologize for being somewhat scatterbrained with the sermon. Uh, it's just, you know, preaching sometimes is a, is a kind of a strange thing because I'm, you know, I have to speak with some authority to you out there because that's what I do. You know, God makes me an elder in the church and I have to, to speak with authority. But it's also like I'm kicking myself throughout the sermon. <laughs> so it's like I'm preaching with authority, but having to submit to the Word of God as my final authority. You know, it's kind of an interesting thing. But um, I just, I've, I've seen this thing so many times, brethren, where I've seen Christians that I think, oh, they're doing so good. And I'm just going, praise the Lord. You know, they get saved and they, they come and they're like, you know, your ministry is really being a big encouragement to me. And, and then I see that it starts to kind of go downhill and I see the, I'm really having some struggles and I'm, you know, I've been, I've been watching this guy and I'm just going like, don't watch false prophets. Please do not watch false prophets. <laughs> well, if I don't, if I only watch, you know, you, Brother Brian, and maybe some other preacher or two, you know, that makes me look cultic and stuff. So I'm trying to watch, and these people are sending me links to videos, and, and I'm just going like, oh, brother. You know, I'd love to be able to recommend hundreds of preachers, but I can't. I'm just, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. You know what I mean? The book, that's, it has to go back to that. And I see people, and it's just like, I see the struggles, and I see, and I'm like, you're putting your Bible down. You're not witnessing to people, you know, and I don't mean witnessing just, you know, just constantly salesman tactic. Just, you know, you know, you know a good way to witness? Um, put bumper stickers on your vehicle. That way it leaves no doubt that you're one of these weird Christians, you know. Here's another way to witness. Carry a Bible with you. Just walk through the store sometime, do your shopping with a Bible. You know, it's an interesting way to witness. Um, wear a shirt with something on it, identifying you as a Christian. A scripture verse on the back or something like that. Really make you look weird. You know, those are good ways to witness. If you're a Christian lady, dress modestly. You know, don't wear pants. Wear a skirt. Wear a dress. You know, not on a Sunday or whatever. I mean, right in the middle of the week. Just, you know, going out there, modest apparel. There are people are going to look at you. What is that? You know? Just go out. Somebody says, beautiful day, isn't it? Just say, praise the Lord. That's why I thank the Lord for it. Yeah. God sure did give us a beautiful day. See, I mean, you don't, when you think of witnessing it, you know, you're thinking to yourself, I got to get in this big conversation and a big, you know, debate with the per. No, no, no. There's lots of ways to witness. And again, as a Christian, you're going to have to build up with this. I mean, some people are outgoing. They can go out and they can witness really good. Others struggle. They struggle with it. I struggle with it, you know. But there's no what you you got to understand something. And I need to get this through to people, and that is there's no middle ground. You're either going to serve God or Mammon. You know, Mammon being money in your King James Bible. If you don't know about that, you're going to have to to serve one master. You can't serve two. You can't just say, well, you know. I'll tell you another little story. There was a a story of a. A guy in the Civil War, you know, the North, they wore blue uniforms, kind of like almost this color here, like a dark navy blue. The South, they wore gray. Well, there was a soldier that he was, he didn't want to be killed, so he put on a navy blue top and gray, you know, pants, thinking that way I'll look like both sides. And after the one battle, they found a the guy laying dead, and he had rebel southern bullets in his top, and Yankee bullets in his legs, <laughs> you know. Just a little way to illustrate the point. You can't take a middle ground as a Christian. So the best thing that you can do is just get fully over onto the side of the Bible and resist the devil with everything that you have in you. And people come around and they say, you know, I just am so glad that we're so inclusive now. Say, well, you know, the Bible says that uh, things are going to get bad and, and, you know, the Bible says, like, can I show you what the Bible says about that? You fanatic, you're this, you're that. Okay. Um, somebody comes around, they say, you know, uh, I think the integration thing is wonderful. All these Muslims, we need to accept Muslims in. And, you know, uh, do you realize that uh, there'd be a new world order, a one world government according to the scriptures? There's so many things that you can do as witnesses for Jesus Christ. Right. So just want to encourage you. And then, you know, like I said, I'm, 
having to examine myself on this whole thing too. So that's going to be it. Um, like I said, just wanted to put this thing together quickly because I'm seeing people that I'm in contact with and I'm seeing the, you know, I mean, the this end of the church age is characterized by falling away. People are falling away right and left from, you know, the scriptures and from taking the right stands. I mean, you, you read, read a book from a Christian back in the 1800s and you realize how far we've fallen. I mean, my word, it's bad. But uh, just be encouraged, brethren. Don't be a demon. Don't forsake the Lord. Don't say, I'm running away from the Bible-believing movement because it's so bad and so negative and whatever else. Just, just fight. Know when to fight. Know when to fall back and kind of regroup a little bit and go back into it again. But the way you're going to survive this thing is just to resist and fight the devil as hard as you can for the rest of the time we have on the earth. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your prayers. And we'll see you in the next video.